Welcome to the Williamson County Library. I'm David Weintraub. I'm a professor of astronomy at Vanderbilt University, and I'm here to talk to you today about life on Mars. As you can see from the first slide, I actually wrote a book about this. This is the cover of the book. I wrote this last year because I was interested in trying to understand what was going on with many of my colleagues and with NASA and others spending so much time and so much effort to try to study Mars and search for evidence of life on Mars. So this is what I learned, and part of what I learned is that nobody knows about this. So I decided I should tell the story, and I'm here to do that. The first thing you need to understand about Mars is that Mars is a very similar planet to the Earth. Mars is the closest planet in the solar system other than Venus to the Earth, and Venus is a incredibly hot planet that bears almost no similarities to the Earth. Mars is very similar to the Earth. The sizes in the image are representative. Mars is about half the diameter of the Earth, which means it's about one-tenth the mass of the Earth. So it's a smaller planet, but it's not a lot smaller than the Earth. What I want you to keep in mind today are two questions. These are the things I'd like you to think about. Can we go to Mars? and should we go to Mars? And those are very different questions, though they may have similar answers, but as I talk today, this is what I want you to think about. So let me start with Elon Musk. Okay. SpaceX is the corporation started by Elon Musk about 20 years ago. Elon Musk wants to go to Mars. Elon Musk wants to send humans as colonists to Mars. And the most important thing you should keep in mind about SpaceX is just about everything they do works which means Elon Musk has a pretty good chance of sending colonists to Mars soon. This is the Falcon Heavy rocket. It's the most powerful rocket that now exists. The first launch of the Falcon Heavy was a year ago. The most recent launch was last week. The Falcon Heavy and SpaceX now puts most satellites in space, whether they're weather satellites, telecommunications satellites, military satellites. NASA has privatized launch vehicles, and SpaceX dominates that market. SpaceX does a great job with these launches. The next step for SpaceX is a rocket that was known as the BFR, which got the name the Big Falcon Rocket. It's now known as the Starship combined with the Super Heavy Rocket. This rocket is supposed to take colonists to Mars. The original plan with SpaceX was to have this rocket ready for launches in 2022 and it would take payloads to Mars and drop them onto Mars. And in 2024, the first colonists would go to Mars. SpaceX has missed this target. This is the first target that SpaceX, to my knowledge, has not met. The first flight to Mars won't be in 2022. The first colonists won't go in 2024. But most likely, this will happen within the decade. By the end of the 2020s, SpaceX will have the ability to send humans to Mars. I don't think there's any question about that. So part of the answer is we will have the ability to go to Mars in the very near future. Jeff Bezos has his own rocket company, Blue Origin. Bezos, in effect, demonstrates the idea that if you have enough billions of dollars, you can build your own rocket company and do stuff in space. So he's also working on privatizing space launches. Blue Origin is not focused on going to Mars. Blue Origin is focused on putting humans to work in Earth orbit. Bezos talks about putting one million humans to work in Earth orbit. I don't know what they're going to do other than deliver packages. but. That's his goal. His next goal is to build a colony on the moon, and then he wants to go to Mars. So there are two different space companies focused on going to Mars, but they're not the only ones. This is a cartoon of what NASA is up to. You don't have to read what's up there. But NASA has a plan to go to Mars. But NASA's plan is a little bit different than that of SpaceX. NASA talks about going to the Mars system in the 2030s. I don't think Mar NASA is going to succeed in getting there in the 2030s. It'll probably be in the 2040s. But NASA is planning to go to Mars. But when they talk about going to Mars, they talk about going to the Mars system, not to Mars. And that's a very important difference. The difference is that we will soon have the ability to send humans to Mars, but we won't have the ability to bring them home from the surface of Mars. 
And because NASA is using tax dollars, NASA has an obligation to, that any astronaut they send into space, they ought to be able to bring home alive. So NASA knows they can't go and put someone on the surface of Mars because to bring them home, we would need a rocket just as big as the one we use to send them to Mars. And we, we would need fuel for that rocket. And we can't send that rocket or the fuel to Mars. And we don't know how to build the rocket or manufacture the fuel on Mars, which means anybody who goes to Mars is staying there for the foreseeable future. SpaceX is not bound by that same ethical constraint that NASA is because SpaceX is a private company. And Elon Musk knows there are a lot of people who would volunteer to go to Mars even if they knew they couldn't come home. Even if they knew that that seven month journey to Mars might be a very dangerous journey because they're not well protected from the harsh radiation environment of space. They're exposed to X-rays, ultraviolet light, cosmic ray particles, and they're going to suffer radiation damage, radiation poisoning. Whether they will survive the mission to Mars, the seven-month trip to Mars, we don't know. Once they get to Mars, once they land on the surface, they need a habitat to live in that protects them from that same harsh radiation environment because the Mars atmosphere will not protect them. And we don't know how to build that habitat on Mars which means they can't live on the surface, they're going to have to live in caves. And we have not found any caves to live in yet. And we don't know how to live in caves in Mars. So they've got a problem. They also have to grow their own food, produce oxygen, de deal with their waste, and find water. So we don't know if they can survive on Mars. Matt Damon may have been pretty good at growing a few potatoes, but that's science fiction. The real thing is figuring out how to survive on the surface of Mars, and we don't know if anybody can do this. So at the moment, SpaceX is very close to having the ability to send colonists to Mars, but they may not have the ability to keep them alive, and they don't have the ability to bring them home. So it may be a suicide mission, those folks who are going to Mars. But we can get there. Whether we should or not, that, I think, is an important question. There are other players in the race to Mars. The United Arab Emirates announced two years ago that in 100 years, they plan to build a city on the surface of Mars. This is their sketch of what their city on Mars will look like. They don't have the equivalent of NASA. They don't have a space agency. They don't have astronauts, but they have very deep pockets. So they may be able to buy their way to Mars, maybe. And there's one other important player in the race to Mars, and that's Mars One. Mars One is a Dutch company that intends to buy off-the-shelf components from other aerospace companies and send astronauts to Mars. And they've already identified their astronaut corps. They just don't have a rocket or any way to get them to Mars or keep them alive on Mars. But they have investors. I don't know why they have investors, but they have investors. So there are at least five international players racing to go to Mars as we speak. And the only thing that's certain is that within a decade, we will have the ability to send humans to Mars. We may not have the ability to keep them alive or to bring them home, but we can get them there. So the chances are very good that within most of our lifetimes, human footprints will appear on the surface of Mars. What I want to do next is talk about the other question, should we go to Mars? And to do that, I want to take you back to some of the early information we learned about Mars, because I think that has colored our conversation about how we talk about Mars. Christian Huygens was the first astronomer who made any important measurements about Mars. The telescope that you see in that image is a tiny little telescope, the equivalent that you could buy at a local uh, science shop these days. He used that telescope in 1659 to look at Mars, and he drew this sketch you couldn't take a picture. You didn't have a phone to snap a picture. He actually drew a sketch with charcoal pen. And he saw this dark patch on the surface of Mars. And we know exactly what that is. It's a feature that is still on Mars. It's called Certus Major. He saw this feature, and he watched it. And over a few hours' time, it moved across Mars and disappeared along the left limb of Mars. And then a few hours later, it reappeared on the other limb of Mars and then rotated into view. And he realized that he was measuring Mars rotating. And he measured the rotation period. And amazingly, the rotation period of Mars was almost exactly 24 hours. There's another planet you know of that has a rotation period of 24 hours. You're living on it. 
the very first measurement about Mars told astronomers that Mars is like the Earth. It's an Earth-like planet, a terrestrial planet with great similarities to Earth. The next important measurement was made by Giacomo Moraldi in the early 18th century. He observed Mars over a number of decades, and what he saw was this little white spot at the pole of Mars. And he realized that that was an ice cap, that Mars has polar caps, just like the Earth. And the next important measurement was made by William Herschel, who at the end of the 18th century discovered that the, the rotation axis of Mars is tilted with respect to the direction of the sun. So in this image, the yellow arrow is supposed to point toward where the sun is. The Earth's rotation axis is tilted at an angle relative to the direction of the sun, and Mars' rotation axis is similarly tilted. And that tilt is the reason we have seasons. And in this cartoon, it illustrates how the seasons work when the rotation axis is tilted in the summer in the northern hemisphere, if you're at the North Pole as the Earth spins, you have 24 hours of daylight. If you're at the South Pole, you have 24 hours of night. Six months later, when the Earth is on the other side of the sun, if you're at the North Pole, you have 24 hours of darkness, the South Pole, 24 hours of light. This is why we have seasons on the Earth, and Mars, with its rotation axis tilted by almost the same amount, also has seasons. So by 1800, astronomers had this idea about the Earth and Mars. They both have days of about 24 hours. They both have years, orbital periods around the sun, of a few hundred days. They both have polar caps. They both have seasons. They both have thin atmospheres above solid surfaces. They both have clouds. Mars is a planet like the Earth. By 1800, astronomers had become convinced that Mars was a very similar planet to the Earth in every way that they could measure. Over the next 100 years, by 1900, astronomers had made a great number of additional measurements that proved that Mars was even more like the Earth. They discovered that Mars's atmosphere was full of water. They discover that Mars has continents and Mars has oceans. They even discover that Mars has canals. Every bit of that was wrong. What they were discovering in the 19th century were things they wanted to find, not things that were actually there. So by 1900, astronomers had created the idea that Mars has living things on it. And the living things on Mars, they thought, were actually advanced engineers who had built a global system of canals to bring the water on Mars from the polar caps to the equator because they said Mars was drying out. And their, their fields where they were growing their crops were near the equator and they were running out of the water, so they had to pipe the water from the polar caps to the equators to stay alive. It was great science fiction. It was terrible science. But this all came about because people wanted life to exist on Mars. The big question for us is whether life really does exist on Mars. Not whether we want it, but whether it's actually there. For the last 25 years or so, since the early 1990s, NASA has been focused with their missions to Mars in trying to discover how much water Mars has and how much water Mars once did have. And we figured that out. We have that answer. If we could go back three billion years in time, this is what Mars would have looked like. Mars once had a tremendous amount of water, and that water was on the surface in the form of liquid, not ice. The southern hemisphere of Mars is topologically high elevation. The northern hemisphere is low. So the water would have pooled in the northern hemisphere, and Mars would have had a northern ocean that covered most of its northern hemisphere. Three billion years ago, Mars was warm, and Mars was wet, and Mars was just like the Earth. Since then, Mars has changed. The water no longer exists in liquid form on the surface. Mars is cold. Mars is arid. Mars is very different from the Earth now. But three billion years ago, you couldn't have told the difference between Mars and the Earth in this sense. And three billion years ago, these guys existed on the Earth. These are known as stromatolites. There are only a handful of places on the Earth where stromatolites still exist. These look like rocks, but these are not rocks. 
these are colonies of blue-green algae that grow sort of like coral. They grow in mats, and then the mat dies, and it lays down a new layer, and it keeps growing and growing and growing, creating these rock-like structures. They are anaerobic bacteria, these blue-green algae things, which survive in environments where there's very low levels of oxygen. The Earth's atmosphere had no oxygen, no free oxygen, three and a half billion years ago. The important thing about the stromatolites, these are modern stromatolites, but stromatolites are known to have existed on the Earth three and a half billion years ago. The oldest fossils we have are fossil stromatolites. The Earth formed about four and a half billion years ago. For the first five, six hundred million years that the Earth was here, the Earth was very hot. There were no continents of significance. The oceans were warm. The Earth was not a place where life could take root. We think that by about 3.9 billion years ago, the Earth had cooled off and life on Earth was possible. We don't have any evidence for life from that time period, but we know just, just as a weird thing astronomers say when we talk about hundreds of millions of years, but only 400 million years later, not only did life exist on Earth, we had colonies of life, not just individual bacteria floating in the ocean. We had colonies. At the same time that these creatures existed on Earth, Mars was warm and wet. And these same kinds of creatures could have existed on Mars. The important thing to take away from this is that when life first formed on Earth, Mars had the same conditions that would have allowed life to form on Mars, which means it is possible that life once existed on Mars. And if life once existed on Mars, the surface of Mars today is a harsh environment where life can't exist. But that life could have found a way to burrow underground and could still exist 10, 20, 30 feet underground, there could be an enormous colony of subsurface life on Mars that are the descendants of the equivalent of stromatolites from three and a half billion years ago. But we don't know. So astronomers are searching for evidence that might tell us that life did or does exist on Mars. And the modern search for this evidence really begins here in 1969. Not only are we approaching the 50th anniversary of the first moon landing, we're approaching the 50th anniversary of the first important planetary flyby. In August 1969, the Mariner 7 mission flew past Mars. We did not yet have the technology to put a spacecraft in orbit around another planet, but this spacecraft flew past Mars and made some very important measurements of Mars. Mariner 7 took a total of 126 grainy black and white pictures of Mars, which showed us that the surface of Mars is a desert, that it's not an Earth-like planet anymore in that sense. But more importantly, the scientists on the Mariner 7 team were able to measure the contents of Mars's atmosphere. And one of the things they were looking for is the presence of methane in the atmosphere of Mars. And we're going to talk about why that's important. This is George Pimentel. He was what's called the principal investigator on the infrared spectrometer that was an instrument on the Mariner 7 mission. The infrared spectrometer was the instrument that measured the contents of the atmosphere of Mars. George Pimentel was a giant of 20th century chemistry. There's a statue on the University of California Berkeley campus of George Pimentel. Most of the work he did was incredibly important work, which is one of the reasons he was the principal investigator of this mission. The Mariner 7 spacecraft flew past Mars on August 5th. Two days later, August 7th, NASA held a press conference so that the Mariner 7 science team could present what they discovered about Mars. I'd suggest this, the press conference was a little premature, and I'll tell you why. George Pimentel announced at that press conference that we are confident that we have detected gaseous methane and gaseous ammonia between approximately 61 degrees and 76 degrees south on Mars 
which means they did not detect methane and ammonia everywhere on Mars. They didn't detect it in the northern hemisphere. They didn't detect it in the entire southern hemisphere, but over one part of Mars toward the South Pole, they detected evidence of methane and ammonia gas in the atmosphere. George Pimentel then turned over the microphone to his colleague Kenneth Kerr, and Kenneth Kerr then demonstrated why you should not take most scientists and put them in front of TV cameras and microphones and news reporters and have them talk about what they've just discovered because they say things they probably shouldn't say. So Kenneth Kerr said, I have no clue as to the origin of these gases. And Kenneth Kerr should have stopped right there because he had no clue. But he continued and he said, but if the readings are true, that was a wise statement, if the readings are true, and I believe they are, but they weren't, we have to face the possibility they could be of biological origin. Detecting methane in the atmosphere of Mars could be evidence of life on Mars. That's why they were looking for methane in the first place. So let me quickly tell you about methane and life. Here's a cow. A cow eats grass. The grass goes into one of the cow's stomachs and bacteria in that stomach digest the grass and produce hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide gas in the cow's stomach. In another part of the cow's digestive system, another family of bacteria, methanogenic bacteria, take the hydrogen and the carbon dioxide and they turn it into methane. And the methane gas comes out both ends of the cow. Life produces methane. This pie chart tells you where the methane in the Earth's atmosphere comes from. So-called ruminant livestock, goats, sheep, cows, llamas, produce 20% of the methane in the Earth's atmosphere. Termites, using the same process, produce 15% of the methane in the Earth's atmosphere. 25% of the methane in the Earth's atmosphere comes from the mining, the production, the distribution, the burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, shale. The coal, oil, and shale all came from early life on Earth. 10% of the methane comes from bacteria in the mud and rice paddies, and 30% comes from landfill systems and bio-waste treatment for systems and manure systems, which is all treating biological material. All of the methane in the Earth's atmosphere comes from life. There's a number on the top of the screen there that says there are 1,800 parts per billion methane in the Earth's atmosphere. That means if you could collect one billion molecules of air, 1,800 of those billion molecules would be methane. And that doesn't sound like much, but as an astronomer, if you could put me on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy, 100,000 light years from Earth, and you said, there's a star out there called the sun with a planet called the Earth orbiting it. Would you please study that planet? I could take a fairly unsophisticated telescope and look across the Milky Way galaxy, and I would have no trouble detecting that amount of methane in the Earth's atmosphere. In addition, I would have no trouble detecting the presence of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. And oxygen and methane don't get along. You cannot have oxygen and methane in the same atmosphere, they compete with each other and the oxygen wins. The oxygen destroys the methane. The only way for the Earth to have that much methane in the atmosphere today is for the methane to be produced today. There's another number on the screen that says the lifetime of methane in the Earth's atmosphere is 12 years. If you could turn off all of those methane production systems on the Earth today, turn off life, and come back in 12 years, most of the methane would be gone. Come back in 100 years, no methane in the Earth's atmosphere. So I can take that telescope from the other side of the Milky Way galaxy and I could prove that life exists on Earth. And that's incredible. And this is why astronomers have focused on studying methane in the atmosphere of Mars. Mars's atmosphere is not oxygen rich like the Earth's atmosphere, but it is carbon dioxide rich. Carbon dioxide is an oxygen-rich molecule which competes with the methane and wins. In Mars's atmosphere, the methane can survive a little bit longer, but the methane can't survive for long. There's another number up there. Methane in Mars's atmosphere can survive for about 300 years. So if you got rid of all the methane in Mars's atmosphere and added some methane again today, come back in 1,000 years, there will be no methane. 
It cannot survive for a long period of time in the sense of what long is for astronomers. So if Mars began with methane in the atmosphere, that methane is long gone. Any methane that we detect in Mars's atmosphere today is being produced by Mars today or recently. That's why the search for methane is important. This is a cartoon that illustrates the four mechanisms that astronomers have hypothesized that might produce methane on Mars. The one on the top left has ultraviolet light shining through the atmosphere, irradiating the surface. The surface is covered with dust, which has rained down from comets and asteroids, and that dust is rich in carbon, and the chemistry of the ultraviolet light with the cosmic dust could produce some methane. Importantly, for what I'll talk about in a little while, that method, method should produce methane everywhere on the planet because ultraviolet light shines onto the whole planet, this cosmic dust is everywhere, this process should produce a little bit of methane in the atmosphere covering the entire surface of Mars. The method on the top right is hypothesized to work, but no one actually knows if it will work. It involves dust devils, just like we have in Arizona, but there are many dust devils in the atmosphere near the surface of Mars, and these dust devils can pick up certain molecules from the surface and perhaps synthesize methane. We, again, don't know if this would work, but if it does work, it also should produce methane everywhere on the planet. There are two more processes. The one on the bottom right involves a rock, a mineral called olivine. Olivine is produced through volcanic processes. There's lots of olivine on the Earth, but there's also lots of olivine on Mars. The Curiosity rover has found olivine in the Gale Crater, for instance. We've also found lots of water on Mars. And the water reacts with the olivine and it produces methane underground. And then that methane could hiccup out of the ground into the atmosphere. The fourth method would actually be life. Microbes underground which produce methane. The Mariner 7 team after their August 7th press conference in 1969 followed that up with a press conference a month later, September 11th. And at that press conference, George Pimentel ate crow. He said, the spectral features previously attributed to methane and ammonia were, whoops, caused by frozen carbon dioxide, dry ice. The infrared spectrometer team should not have held a press conference on August 7th. They should have taken their data and gone into their laboratory and worked hard on it to understand what we would call the systematics, the background noise, all the things that might have produced that signal they measured. And if they'd done so, they would have discovered that they detected carbon dioxide, not methane, and they never would have had that initial press conference in which they announced that they might have discovered evidence of life on Mars. But they had the initial press conference, and the initial reporting from the first press conference was on page one of every newspaper, and the retraction didn't make very many newspapers, which meant word is out there that we've already discovered life on Mars, but we haven't. The Wall Street Journal reported that this is a perfect example of the hazards of quick conclusions, which is quite correct. About three years later, the Mariner 7 team produced their final answer about methane, and their final answer is, we didn't detect it. We can report what's called an upper limit, that Mars has no more than this much methane. How much methane? 5,600 parts per billion. That's not a detection, that just says Mars has less than that much methane, but it might be zero. That was the Mariner 7 result. Since that time, for the last 50 years, we have been chasing evidence of methane on Mars. And the latest chaser is this guy, the Mars Curiosity rover. Launched in 2012, landed in 2012. This is a self-portrait by uh, the rover. They took about 2,000 pictures with the camera and then used image processing to put them all together to take this selfie. So this is probably the most expensive selfie ever taken, but it's a great one. The Curiosity rover, after landing in 2012, tried to measure how much methane is in Mars's atmosphere. The Curiosity rover is about the size of a dune buggy, a small car, and it is a very sophisticated chemistry laboratory that is roving around slowly on the surface of Mars. It's not a telescope. 
It's a chemistry lab, and it's got a little nozzle, and it sucks in Martian air, and then it sends a laser through the air it's sucked in to measure the contents of the air. In December of 2013, they reported what they discovered. They had discovered that Mars has no methane. Their answer was, again, an upper limit less than one-fifth of one molecule per billion molecules, no methane. That would seem to have put the whole methane on Mars business to rest, except it didn't. They kept making measurements, and two years later, in December of 2015, they reported a new result. And the new result was that Mars has a little methane, but not all the time. They reported that prior to December 2013, there was no methane. But in December of 2013 and January of 2014, they detected methane. And then the methane went away. And you might remember we said the lifetime of methane in Mars's atmosphere is 300 years, not three weeks. If the atmosphere is full of a methane, even a little bit of methane, it shouldn't disappear in a month's time. So either the detection was wrong, or there's something mysterious about this methane that they detected. The amount of methane de they detected was seven parts per billion, which is significant. And I don't think there are any chemists or planetary scientists who think the measurement is wrong. They almost certainly detected seven parts per billion methane. The question is, where did it come from? Two, three of four. Four headlines here around the world after that discovery. Methane gas is clue to life on Mars from the BBC. A great moment, rover finds methane, a clue that Mars may harbor life. The New York Times, I'll skip the New York Daily News. The National Geographic says, alien life on Mars, NASA rover spots methane, a possible sign of microbes. Methane on Mars is a big deal. We've talked about a couple of the sources of the methane. The top one is the idea that the methane may be the result of cometary dust raining onto the surface. The middle one is the process by which water and olivine react to produce the methane. But one of the more interesting possibilities is this last one. Kevin Zonley is a very uh, well-respected planetary scientist who works for NASA. And he said, I'm convinced that they're really seeing methane, but I'm thinking that it has to be coming from the rover they may have brought the methane with them from Florida. They may have conducted the most expensive experiment to ever prove that life exists on Earth by taking swamp gas from Florida to Mars. And then the hoses and the tubes inside the Curiosity rover spit out the methane, which they then detected. And that would explain why it wasn't there until they did certain tests, and then it was there, and then it went away, because it was never in the Mars atmosphere. It was just inside the rover, Florida methane. But that's not the end of the story. Last December, December of 2018, the Curiosity rover team produced this result. They said the amount of methane they're detecting rises and falls with the seasons, goes up and down. Now, what they're detecting is very low. They say that the average amount of methane is 0.4 parts per billion, really, really low. But that it goes up as high as 0.7 parts per billion, and then goes down again. Now, having said they detected it going up and down with the seasons, we should be careful and note that they detected it going up and down with a season. They haven't detected the cycle in a second season, so we don't know if this is right or not but they seem to have detected a small amount of methane again. And this isn't over yet because just this year, there was an announcement that the Curiosity rover had actually detected methane once prior to December 2013, and that was on June 16th, 2013. And just on that one day, they detected 5.78 parts per billion methane, which is significant. But it wasn't there on the 15th or the 17th. It was just there for one day. That's puzzling. One of the spacecraft that's in orbit around Mars is called the Mars Express, a European Space Agency uh, telescope that is orbiting and looks down. And on that same day, June 16th, 2013, the Mars Express spacecraft was looking down where Curiosity was in the Gale Crater. And it also 
detected methane at a level of 15 and a half parts per billion. And that's in a larger piece of the atmosphere, not just in the gas that is sucked into the Curiosity rover. Where could that have come from? People have hypothesized that there's a source region 500 kilometers east of the crater, and the prevailing winds blew a cloud of methane over the Curiosity rover, and it sniffed it, and then that cloud dispersed. And some folks have tried to make a map based on the prevailing winds of where that source region is. And this is a little hard to see, but underneath these squares, this is the Gale Crater right here. And these boxes indicate the percentage likelihood that that is the source region of the methane. And this region over here, east, southeast of the Gale Crater, is where people think is the most likely source of the methane, that there must be permafrost here, and a crack appeared in the permafrost, and a bubble of methane came out of the ground. That's the hypothesis. We're, of course, not done yet, because just this week, there were new announcements about methane. NASA announced that on June 19th, about eight days ago, the NASA Curiosity rover has measured the highest level of methane gas ever found in the atmosphere of Mars. The reading taken at Gale Crater was 21 parts per billion. That's a big number. There's a, another orbiting telescope called the Trace Gas Orbiter. It's a European-Russian mission. And it looked down on Gale Crater on June 19th, and it did not detect methane. NASA repeated some of the measurements just last weekend, the weekend of June 21st to June 23rd, and did not detect any methane. So the methane was not there before June 19th and was there June 19th, but the European Trace Gas Orbiter couldn't detect it, and three days later it's gone. Which either means there was a pup of methane that just happened to drift over the rover, and then it dispersed, and it was such a small little bubble of methane that it was detectable by the rover but not detectable from space and then it dispersed so it can't be seen anymore or there's something wrong with the measurements and we don't understand the measurements and maybe they didn't detect methane we simply don't know all of that being said the bottom line now is that there are measurements that suggest there could be puffs of methane burping out of the surface into Mars's atmosphere, and that that methane has to come from underground. And it's a small source, and the Curiosity rover is in just the right place to detect it, and all of that is possible. And if you remember the cartoon of those four different possible sources of methane, Two of them produce methane in the atmosphere, and they should be global sources of methane. Those can't produce those puffs. The only two sources of methane, if the, if the methane is real, one is serpentinization, the water reacting with some rocks. The other is bacteria underground. We're down to two possible sources of methane, and one of them is life, which means we may have detected life on Mars, but we actually don't know. So I want to take you somewhere else to wrap this up. I want to take you to the outer part of the solar system. This is Europa. Europa is a moon of Jupiter. Europa is one of the big moons of Jupiter. Europa does not have an atmosphere, but its surface is warm. Its insides are warm. You can look at the surface and you see a few little craters, but the surface of Europa has almost no craters because the ice on the surface is too soft to preserve the evidence of craters. Inside Europa is an ocean, a liquid water ocean, and I'll show you a cartoon of that in a moment. There's another moon in the solar system that has a similar structure. This is a moon of Saturn and Celadus. Again, the surface is water ice. There are a few craters you see at the North Pole there in this image, or the northern part of the image, but most of the surface is too warm to preserve evidence of craters. Inside these two moons, we know what the structure is. Over time, because the inside is warm, the moons are about 50% rock and 50% water. And when you heat up the insides, the heavy rock sinks to the center, and they have a core of rock. And they have an outer layer of water. And the outermost part of it is exposed to space, and it's cold, so it's ice. But as you go deep into the ice, 
the ice gets warmer, and eventually it gets warm enough that it would be liquid. Both of these moons have global subsurface oceans, complete spherical oceans below their surfaces, maybe as close as 10 kilometers below the surface, maybe as deep as 100 kilometers below the surface, but these moons have global liquid water oceans. And that means you have heat, and you have water, and you have calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, all of the ingredients that would allow life to exist. And planetary scientists think Europa and Enceladus are tremendous candidates for places in the solar system where life could exist. We don't know if life does exist there, but if you would insert life into those oceans, the life could survive. The question is whether life is there. This is a wonderful image from NASA. This is an image of Enceladus, and what you see, this is the surface of Enceladus, and these are geysers, like Yellowstone geysers, erupting 100 kilometers into space. There's no atmosphere to hold the geysers down. This is from the liquid water oceans that are heated below, and cracks appear in the surface, and these geysers erupt out of the surface. And if life exists in that subsurface ocean, and if you could fly to Enceladus and fly a drone through those geysers, you could sweep up the water, and maybe you'd detect evidence of life erupting out of those geysers. Why is this relevant? Because NASA had a mission in orbit around Jupiter, the Galileo mission, from 1995 to 2003. It's from that mission that we learned so much about Jupiter and about Europa and Io and Ganymede and Callisto. But in 2003, Galileo was running out of propellant. Once the mission ran out of propellant, gravity would control its orbit for forever. Which means Jupiter would pull on it, and Io and Europa and Ganymede and Callisto would pull on it. And there was a likelihood, small, but Nevertheless, a real possibility that eventually that spacecraft could crash into Europa, put a crater into Europa, contaminate Europa. And the planetary science community convinced NASA that that should not be allowed to happen. So the last little bit of propellant on the Galileo mission was used to steer it on an orbit that took it into the atmosphere of Jupiter and it burned up in the atmosphere of Jupiter so that it cannot contaminate Europa, because Europa might have life. The Cassini mission orbited Saturn from 2004 to 2017, and in September 2017, the Cassini mission was running out of propellant, so the last little bit of fuel was used to steer Cassini so that it burned up in Saturn's atmosphere. So not next year, not in a million years, not in a hundred million years, the Cassini mission can never crash into the surface of Enceladus, put a crater into the surface, and contaminate Enceladus because life might exist below the surface of Enceladus. Europa and Enceladus are two places where we know life could exist, and we've made the decision that we should not contaminate those worlds because they might have active biology. What about Mars? One other thing before I come back to Mars. This was a report from last December from a global team of scientists which is searching for evidence of life below the surface of the Earth. And they have found vast colonies of life below the surface. This report said, global team of scientists find ecosystem below Earth that is twice the size of world's oceans. Despite extreme heat, no light, minuscule nutrition, and intense pressure, scientists estimate that this subterranean biosphere is teeming with between 15 billion and 23 billion tons of microorganisms, hundreds of times the combined weight of every human on the planet. They reported that the results suggest that 70% of Earth's bacteria and archaea, which are the most ancient form of bacteria, exist below the surface of the Earth. One organism found two and a half kilometers below the surface has been buried for millions of years and may not rely at all on energy from the sun. Instead, the methanogen, the methane-producing organism, has found a way to create methane in this low-energy environment. Below the Earth's surface, there is life. It is life that is not dependent on the sun. 
And this team of scientists has demonstrated that if you took a drill and picked any place on this planet, below a river, below a mountain, on any continent on the planet, if you drill down a couple miles, you are going to find life. Life exists below the surface of the Earth. So Mars? If life once existed on the surface of Mars, could it still exist a kilometer beneath the surface or 10 meters below the surface? The answer is yes. Life could exist on Mars. We have not yet found proof that life exists on Mars, and Mars might in fact be sterile. The methane that we've found may not be produced by life. The evidence for the methane that's been reported might in fact be wrong. We don't know how to interpret it. But we have evidence that suggests the possibility that life exists on Mars. But we're not treating Mars in the same way we treat Europa and Ganymede. We're being careful and treating Europa and Ganymede as places that we should not contaminate. Yet for Mars, we're saying, let's go, let's colonize Mars. If we set foot on Mars, we will contaminate Mars. We will take our waste and we will take our drills and we will take our energy production mechanisms and our manufacturing mechanisms and we will contaminate Mars. And if life, Mars has life, then the question becomes, who wins? Do we wipe out Martian life? Or is the Martian life something that will compete with us and be very bad for us if we bring life from Mars back to Earth? Scientifically, there are some incredibly interesting questions that we probably will not be able to answer if we contaminate Mars. First, we ask, does Mars have life or not? If Mars does not have life, go ahead, colonize Mars, who cares? But if Mars does have life, then there are two possibilities. The first is, life on Mars is based on DNA. Every last bit of Earth, life on Earth is based on DNA. The chances that two funny little planets orbiting the same average star, the Sun, both developed life and happened to develop DNA-based life independently is almost certainly zero. Which means if Mars has life and it's DNA-based, life got started on Mars and was transferred to Earth or from Earth and was transferred to Mars. And we know it's much easier to get a rock from the surface of Mars to Earth than the other way around, which means if we find DNA-based life on Mars, we know two things. One, life can be transferred from one world to another. And two, your grandparents were Martians. That would be pretty incredible to know. The second possibility is that life exists on Mars, but it is not DNA-based, in which case life got started on Mars almost certainly independently of life on Earth. And that would tell us that two neighboring planets around the same average everyday star both started life a long time ago. That would probably tell us that life exists in abundance throughout the universe. The closest place in the universe where we can do that test and make that discovery is right next door on Mars. But we can't learn that if we contaminate Mars first. And whether Mars has DNA-based life or non-DNA-based life, if Mars has life, we should be asking the question whether we have the right to contaminate Mars or whether we have the obligation to leave Mars alone. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to take them. the fossil evidence of life? So, a couple of years ago, we found a meteorite. Oh, the meteorite, okay. Okay, you have to read the book. There's a whole chapter of that in the book. Yes, there's, there's a meteorite that was discovered in Antarctica in 84. It's known as Allen Hills 84001 because it was discovered in 1984 and it was the first one of those Antarctic meteorites cataloged. By the early 1990s, astronomers recognized that that particular meteorite came from Mars. It's a Martian meteorite. And a lot of folks began studying it in detail, and one team decided that the measurements they made indicated that there was fossil life in that meteorite. Almost all of that evidence has now been dismissed. 
I probably need a few fingers on one hand to count the number of scientists who think that there is evidence for life in that meteorite. Everyone else says, no, it's not. But you cannot absolutely dismiss it as evidence. The most compelling visual evidence in the meteorite were these little things that looked like tube-like bacteria. They are very, very small. If they're bacteria, they'd be nanobacteria. And biologists on Earth think that bacteria can't be that small, that there isn't enough space inside that tube for the chemistry of life to exist. So most biologists now say th those are just minerals. They're not biological materials. However, there are some little mineral grains in the meteorite, which some of them, one's called magnetite, is produced by bacteria to orient themselves in the Earth's magnetic field. Okay? And the magnetite is not normally produced in the same mineral environment as some other minerals in that meteorite, which suggests that maybe biology was responsible for producing those minerals and putting them out of what's called equilibrium. So maybe that's evidence. But m again, most people have now dismissed that. But just like the methane, there's a, a little bit of evidence that might be right, but it's probably wrong from the meteorite. There's a little bit of evidence that remains from the Viking landers in the 1970s that 99.999% of all the scientists have dismissed and said, that's not evidence of life. But there are a handful of people who say, no, maybe the Viking landers showed a little evidence of life. And then there's the methane. There are all these little things, none of which can be dismissed completely, absolutely. But none of them are strong pieces of evidence yet. The methane is the strongest. But again, we simply don't know whether it's, it's right or wrong. And if it's right, if the measurements are right, whether it's life or geology that's producing that. I think the rover probably can be ruled out as the source of the recent methane eruptions. Could the, the rover have been the source of the December 2013, December 2014 methane measurements? I think there's a good chance that that's the case. It might even be the case that the June 16th, 2013 measurement was terrestrial methane that the rover brought with. But it's been seven years now. I don't think there could be any terrestrial methane left in the rover. I think any measurements they make now that show there's some methane almost certainly are measuring methane that is in the atmosphere of Mars. The question then becomes, what is the source of that methane? All right. How do we find out? We keep making the measurements. Well, we're not good at measurements. Well, the, the Curiosity rover continues to make measurements. The trace gas orbiter continues to look for evidence from orbit. There are two missions going to Mars in 2020. The European Space Agency has the ExoMars 2020 rover that's going to Mars. And NASA has a rover going to Mars in 2020 that doesn't have a name yet, but they just announced a contest to name it. Those two rovers have the same job, looking for evidence of life on Mars. They're not both only looking for methane, they're looking for other kinds of evidence, but we can continue to look using orbiting telescopes, orbiting around Mars, and using rovers, continue to look, use robots to look for evidence of life on Mars before we try to send humans there. I think if we invested a few more decades in the robotic exploration of Mars, we would come to a conclusion that was extremely robust, which we had great confidence in, that said Mars does or does not have life, and we can move on from that. I think at the moment we're in too much of a hurry to put humans on Mars because that sounds like such an exciting, adventurous thing to do. But it's expensive, and it puts Mars at risk if there's life on Mars. In addition, I have not heard anybody provide an economic justification for colonizing Mars. If you're trying to make money from colonizing Mars, it doesn't make any sense. If you want to do manufacturing in space, do it in Earth orbit, do it in lunar orbit, do it on the surface of, moon, of the moon. But why would you do it on the surface of Mars? It makes absolutely no sense. 
If all you're trying to do is colonize Mars so that humans have another place to live because we're destroying this planet, maybe it would make more sense to invest your billions of dollars in not destroying this planet. So I don't think we have to go to Mars to survive. And there's no financial economic justification for doing it at the moment. So I'm curious, maybe someone else can tell me the reason we're trying to go to Mars, other than it's there. All right, thank you very much.